Okay, folks, we're going to get started, so please take your seats. Good morning and welcome to the third of the Western Governors Association Species Conservation and ESA Initiative. My name's John Freemuth. I'll be your moderator throughout today and tomorrow. I'm a professor, public policy at Boise State and senior fellow for Cease Andrus, who many of you I'm sure know by reputation, our governor and secretary of interior at his policy center. For the Rams in the room, I also have a PhD from Colorado State. Just thought I'd throw <laughs> that in there. <laughs> okay. Um, Jim Augsbury, the executive director, cannot be here. His mom passed away recently, and he's down uh, being with the family. He sends his regrets, wishes he would be here um, to see all of you, to see the governors, uh, but he can't be. So with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce the host of the meeting, your governor, the um, governor of the great state of Colorado, Governor John Hickenlooper. John, I didn't know you'd gone to CSU, but that, that doctor, we're glad to hear that. I'll start trumpeting that. Or, you, know, you can't use the word trumpeting out anymore. In, in political discourse with the presidential primaries, trumpeting has taken on a a different tone. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, John, and, and for helping moderate this. Uh, I want to recognize and, and and thank deeply Jim Oxbury, even though he couldn't be here, he had a death in the family. Uh, he has played a large role, not just in this effort, but really helping rebuild the Western Governors Association into uh, an influential organization as it, as it has been for so many years. Uh, and I want to give a special shout out to Matt Mead, our chair of the Western Governors Association. And over the last five or six years, we've become very good friends. And, you know, when he's not schooling me uh, at the one shot antelope hunt, uh, he could be a pretty good guy. Uh, you know, with, with the winter weather in place, or still in full swing, I guess, um, I, I know most of you, or many of you, have your sights already set on the next workshop that's going to be in April in Hawaii. Uh, so with that in mind, I want to give particular thanks for you coming to this one. Uh, I realize this isn't uh, Hawaii. Uh, Matt Mead and I worked uh, a lot on sage grouse uh, with the sage grouse task force. And I think that the collective efforts that came out of that, uh, that work uh, you know, with a long list of, of uh, land management agencies and federal agencies, Western states, land over owners, conservation groups, uh, multiple industries, uh, allowed us to get to that historic non-listing uh, about the greater sage, sage grouse uh, this last fall. Uh, the scale of the, of the conservation efforts uh, to a single species was such a, sprawling range uh, really was remarkable. I think it demonstrated a bunch of important, you know, kind of foundational premises. Uh, we did have on many sides unprecedented leadership. Uh, you know, it's always, it's become a great sport to attack federal agencies and leaders. But Sally Jewell, I think by any measure, she stepped up and, and put she and her team put in so much time in trying to get the, the sage grouse to the right, and it was never preordained, but get the, the sage grouse to the right place where we could get everyone working together and really demonstrate that we could uh, turn around uh, the expectations on a specific species. And I think we should re recognize her every time I see her, I try to make sure I thank her because uh, I can only imagine, I know how many times she called me, I know how many times she called Governor Mead, uh, she put a lot of her own personal time into it. Uh, I think the preservation of the habitat, make sure that that species is going to uh, 
survive and, 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 and grow and get better, flourish, uh, shows what happens when we are able to come together and identify common interests, um, and what we can do to protect wildlife, and, and how we can look at the different ways we can impact the environment uh, while making sure that we still support our agricultural industries and our other uh, economies. Uh, hopefully today, you're gonna continue the, the workshops, the, the efforts that Governor Mead has been leading uh, and draw upon that, the individual efforts around the greater sage-grouse model uh, and look at other innovations that are taking place, not just in Colorado, but all over the West uh, to make sure that we continue the dialogue about how the ESA uh, can be used effectively and responsibly to uh, protect and recover endangered species, but also to look at you know, continuously improving habitat. Um, the agenda today has been designed to highlight the key themes that have worked and come out in the previous workshops uh, in Idaho and in Wyoming uh, to make sure that we get a little bit of a deeper dive into the issues that, you know, where we think the greatest strides can be made. Uh, how do we facilitate more robust investment uh, in science and measurable outcomes? Uh, Dr. Freemuth is an expert in that, that nexus between science and how to, how to navigate the, the imperfections in science to, to get to the appropriate outcomes. Uh, what kind of role do incentives play uh, to promote uh, a variety of conservation efforts, but especially voluntary conser conservation efforts? Uh, how can we get timelines around that streamlined and clarified? Uh, how do we get clarity in further economic analysis and projections? Uh, and then how can we improve the, the local, the state, the federal coordination to ensure that the, the concert, conservation efforts that we uh, engage into are adequately funded and then get implemented across the appropriate landscape? Um, these are tough questions that Governor Mead is going to answer, <laughs> uh, or at least allow us the opportunity to consider. Uh, certainly in Colorado, we know that this work means finding ways to, to ranch and to farm, to harvest our abundant energy resources, uh, to accommodate a growing population, to recognize the outdoor recreation and other industries that use these lands, um, while, but at the same time making sure that we're improving the native habitat of our wildlife. Uh, I'm, like everybody in this room, I think aware of some of the difficulties that the, the current law has presented, um, but I think what we're seeing in the last few years is that, that we don't have these challenges exclusively because of the law, but in, in many cases because we haven't had the right framework for conversation, for communication, and ultimately for collaboration. Uh, so I think obviously everybody here today has a certain investment. You're putting your, your, your time in here and you're going to do your, your best listening. Uh, I've learned, like I think most governors figure out along the way that the best way to persuade somebody in a specific direction is to listen a little harder to them. Um, so I certainly encourage everyone to do more listening than talking, given the number of people that you don't really have a choice. Um, and I certainly look look forward to following what comes out of this in the next couple of days. Uh, I mean, I, these workshops, I've have been amazed. And this is something that really is different between governors and mayors. But when you come up to a governor level, workshops like these become for a variety of reasons, much more productive, and, and you end up with real outcomes uh, if everybody keeps their head down and, and focuses. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our chair uh, and someone who has become, once in the first time we went and had a one-shot antelope hunt when he missed his antelope and I killed my antelope, oh, or and I took two shots, it's true, I did not do the kill the antelope on one shot, uh, but since then he has been just a dead eye. Uh, the governor of Wyoming, Matt Mead. Thank you, Governor Hickenlooper, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, for being here this morning. Um, as I had a chance uh, while we were waiting for John to visit with some of you, uh, we, uh, we've got a great expertise here. We've got a legislator from North Dakota. We have some wonderful NGOs. We have our great state partners and federal partners, 
and uh, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic opportunity for all of us to learn a little bit more and uh, hopefully come out uh, with some great recommendations as we head into the fourth meeting in Hawaii. Collectively with these meetings, this is the third, and with the webinars, uh, we've had over 3,000 people participate, 3,400 people. That does not include the number of people, which is many more than that, who've participated by watching the webinars. And so this has been an initiative uh, that I took on that has really gained momentum because people are passionate about it. So I want to thank all of you, and uh, I want to thank Dan Ash and Secretary Jewell. Um, you know, they really have uh, difficult jobs, Governor Hickenlooper, as you know, and they they personally get involved in these issues. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and we had individual meetings with the secretary and the director, uh, the Western governors did, and then we had individual meetings trying to work through difficult issues that surround the Endangered Species Act. And so, uh, while all of us or at least many of us have concerns about how the Endangered Species Act is working, where it's working well, and how it could be improved. It's certainly not for a lack of effort, I think, from uh, the federal partners. They work extremely hard on this issue. And I want to have a special thanks to you, my friend, Governor Hickenlooper, for hosting this. I appreciate it. I know you had an extremely long day yesterday traveling across the country, and it is great to be with you. You're always a, a most generous and a gracious host. Uh, I love the fact that um, while our states compete in many ways, including uh, CSU and the University of Wyoming, that uh, we overcome those competitions and celebrate uh, when you come up for Frontier Days and the One Chat Antelope Hunt. Uh, it's always great to have you in Wyoming and you host us so very nicely here in, uh, in Colorado. And I would also say that you know it was critical, I think, as we worked on the sage grouse uh, issue, to have uh, you and I as chairs uh, for the entire initiative uh, because you needed that bipartisan effort. You needed two states that were vested in it uh, to the highest degree. And uh, so I thank you for your leadership there as well, John. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So I drove down uh, from Cheyenne uh, this morning. I left early this morning. And it was a, it was a wonderful trip uh, because as you leave Cheyenne and you come down here, it's a reminder of why we are so fortunate to live in the West. Because as you drive along, you see antelope, uh, you get to see uh, birds, you get to see uh, saw some prairie dogs along the way, but you also see great farms and great ranches. You see oil and gas development. You see the cities uh, grow and the growth of the cities. And when we think about the Endangered Species Act, we recognize that it has had some tremendous successes. And I think about, for example, I can't remember the last time, if ever, I have uh, been with somebody where we don't see some species and it's remarkable. You know, take the bald eagle, for example. If you've ever been with somebody when you've seen a bald eagle and didn't say, hey, there's a bald eagle, I bet that's a rare occasion. Because we in the West, we absolutely appreciate wildlife and all that it brings to us. But we also have an appreciation for our farms and ranches, for our mineral development and our tourism. And so the reason I wanted to take up this act is that it affects so much of what we do here in the West or what we're able to do. It affects the value that we have for wildlife and it affects our ability to have the industries that we need for us to have strong economies here in the West. It's not just a Western issue, though. While we are you know, focused on the West, as I talk to governors on the East Coast, say, for example, in Florida, we know it's a big issue. The next meeting in Hawaii is also going to be a big issue. I am not educated at all on marine species, but I know that is a very difficult issue for them. And so it is a nation's issue, and it's an important issue. And as we look at the Endangered Species Act, we recognize it was passed in 1973. Since it was passed in 1973, when we started this initiative, when I kicked off this initiative in August, there was 2,221 species that were listed. 2,221. Since we started this initiative in August, 25 additional species have been added to that list three have been taken off. 
Since 1973, of all the species listed, which is 2,308, only 33 have been taken off because of recovery. That's a 1.4% success rate. And when you think about 1.4%, if you care about species and you care about habitat, I think you would recognize we can do better. We need fundamentally a better job to do a better job at recovering species. We have some examples now where it has worked. If we look at sage grouse, there was a recognition by the states and by our counties and towns that you could do everything perfect in your town, your state, and your county but you're still not gonna address the issue because it is a Western landscape issue. And that's why Governor Hickenlooper and I, along with the federal partners and local partners, put together the team that we did. Before we ever did that though, towns and counties and states had been doing a lot of work. But that model of rather than a few coming together and say, we're gonna sue or we're gonna do this, that model of saying, listen, this is an issue of importance. It's important for species and it's important for industry. We've got to come together and solve it. That is one of the ways. I certainly think we can do a better job of recovery. But the other way we need to do a better job in recovery is this. We've got to cross the finish line in terms of the sage grass on not having it listed. And what do we get? We go to court. We go to court. And if that model doesn't work, if that doesn't get you across the finish line and you ask the question, how do we do a better job recovering species? You have to have a way of reaching the goal line. Because I challenge the next group that is multi-town, multi-county, multi-state to come together and spend years in the making trying to come up with a plan to address a species that may be endangered, when it looks like all you get for your efforts is to hire lawyers. Lawyers are winning on the Endangered Species Act, but the question are those species winning. And so if you want to do better in recovery, you have to show that there is a plan with efforts and money and conservation where you can get across the finish line. Because otherwise, how are we going to continue to motivate towns and counties and states, along with our federal partners, to come together in a collaborative fashion that we saw on the sage grouse to help a species out if it just looks like we're going to end up in the same place we've always ended up in many different species, which is in court, in litigation. You want to do better in recovery, we've got to have a goal line that can be reached and a goal line that once reached can be celebrated. These should be good news stories. It should be viewed in any case. If you're listing a species, the, something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong. We have not done our job. We need to do a better job to prevent species from being listed by conservation efforts. We need to do a better job failing that once they are listed and having a process where we can do right by the habitat and the species to get it delisted. Because effectively at 1.4%, success rate. When you have the sage grouse team that we put together that was all across the West and you still can't get across the finish line. The Endangered Species Act is the equivalent of a game of tic-tac-toe. There's no winning absent a few people not paying attention to get you to 1.4 percent. If we care about species, if we care about habitat, we need to have a way for success celebrate the success, and then move on to the next species. For me in Wyoming, wolves are an example. They've clearly been recovered for a long period of time. We work with Secretary Salazar, Dan Ash, our local game and fish, got it across the finish line and a plan. And where are we? We're back in court. Even though the court recognized wolves have fully recovered. So by not being able to get across the finish line, we're disincentivizing people of good faith who want to step up, care about the species, to move forward. 
We are ignoring species and habitat that need our help by continuing to focus time and money and effort on species that have clearly recovered. And so I wanted to bring all of you together to ask for your help, your ideas, on how we can do better. I grew up on a, a ranch in Wyoming, and third generation Wyoming rancher. And in the ranching community, uh, and I still hear this today, the sentiment that I do not agree with, but it's shoot, shovel, and shut up. That is, if you find an endangered species, it's viewed as the worst news possible. We need to change that. It should be viewed as good news. We should celebrate finding a species that needs help on your ranch or your farm, but it doesn't mean the demise of your livelihood. And in order to do that, there has to be an effective process. When you find that endangered species of how can we help, how can we collaborate with between states and get it across the finish line and then move to the next one. Because we in the West, as I said, we love our wildlife. And we love hearing successes like the black-footed ferret, the work that was done in Wyoming. It's a Bell Canyon for many years getting the black-footed ferret up. We love hearing successes about the grizzly bear and the wolves. But we're not celebrating those by saying our work here is at a good point. We will continue on, but let's look at the next habitat, the next species. And as I talked to some of you uh, from NGOs, you know, this is so much of what you focus on. And it must be frustrating to you as well to feel like you're spending time with a species that you know is recovered and you're ignoring those that actually need our help. And where I want to go, and I get asked this a lot, where do you want to go with this? Well, let me just say, if we ended after Hawaii, the amount of conversation that has occurred, the amount of discussion that have occurred, the amount of expertise you and many others have brought to the table, it has been worthwhile because it is an important issue and it's just worthwhile to discussion. But that's not enough. We at Western Governors want to come out with some policy that also helps on this issue. But I don't believe that's enough as well. I want to take it from Western Government Association and in a bipartisan fashion say here are some legitimate things we can do both in practice and in law that will help better protect species and better provide a level of enthusiasm rather than fear of the Endangered Species Act. That's not enough. I then want to take it to the National Government Association where I chair the Natural Resources Committee and see if we can get a nationwide bipartisan support for some changes. And then I want to go to the next step, which is to Congress. And that's where most people are with me until I say I'm going to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, that is not a good idea, Mead. <laughs> but it, I have to say this, that if we can get bipartisan support at the Western Governor's level and at the National Governor's level, from a consensus from this group and the three other groups on here's some things that we can actually do. I have to believe that people of good faith can take those recommendations to Congress and that changes can be made. Because if we can't do that, there's greater things that need to address the Endangered Species Act. And I know Secretary Jewell in particular is fearful of going to Congress and it going one way or another too far. But we cannot just say we give up. We don't have faith in the process. And I gain faith in the process by the diverse group that is here today and the diverse groups that have been at the other meetings and the diverse group that will be in Hawaii. Because we don't want to go hard this way or hard this way. We want a consensus from different groups, different viewpoints on how we can do better for species in our states, in our nation. And so that is my goal. We will see where it leads us. I don't know what those recommendations will be and I don't wanna judge what they should be because they need to come from the NGOs, from our federal partners, our state partners on where we should go. So again, I thank you all for being here. And I finished where I started, which is 
we in the West are fortunate because when we see wildlife, we recognize certainly what that means to our economies. But even more importantly that, we recognize it means to our quality of life. Our quality of life is diminished when we can't walk out our front door and see the beautiful wildlife. Our quality of life is diminished when we have businesses that are closing down because they can't figure out a way to negotiate around the act to help habitat, to help species. So we ask again for your help. We appreciate all of you being here. And Governor Hickenlooper, I'll just close with saying that, you know, as you know, uh, great politicians in our, in our country are often recognized for words that have never been spoken. I'm not one of those. But I do want to report to you, the day after the Super Bowl, I, in my State of the State address, I uttered words that have never been uttered before in the State of the State in Wyoming which was, how about them Broncos? <laughs> I'm glad I did because that was the first and only applause I got for the rest of the speech. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this morning. <laughs>